Good morning, I'm Tasha. Good morning, everybody. I'm Elisa, and we're so glad you're joining us here today. If this is your first time, we just want to let you know what's going to happen. Me and Elisa are going to chat for a bit, and then we're going to go over to the live session. We're going to come right back, so you don't want to don't want to miss it. And boy, have we got a Sunday for you. Mm -hmm. You know, at South Point Church, we say that we have big people church and little people church. Mm -hmm. Well, for those of you watching online today, we want to let you know that Pastor Matt is in week four of his series, Bow Chicka Wow Wow. Sex. Yes, that is the topic for today. <laughs> and we want to let you know that if you have elementary or younger students, you may want to encourage them to go over to southpointforyou.com slash kids. The content of the message is excellent and it's relevant and it's exactly a word that people need to hear, but it may not be for little ears. And so, like I said, we have big people church and little people church. Today might be a great day to go to little people church. Yep, big people's church is about sex. Mm -hmm. Whether you're watching from Facebook or YouTube for the best experience, we want you to go over to southpointforyou.com slash live. Um, as well, go ahead and fill out the connect card. It should be popping up or you can go to southpointforyou.com slash connect. Yep, and speaking of connection, did you know that South Point has a 5K coming up? And for those of you who are like me, it's a 5K fun as well as a 5K <laughs> run. We have a beautiful piece of property. Five acres give you a chance to explore and really get out and get to know people. Mm -hmm. You can go to South Point for you to register for that. And also talking about fun, it's also going to be a great opportunity. The fun run is going to be a great opportunity for families so that you can bring your littles out, let them get some energy out, and then also support the cause. And you know, the cause that you're going to be supporting is to send our middle school and high school students to camp this summer. They'll be going to Florida for a week to hear about God, to meet other students who are in the same age group that they are, and just really enter in and have a great time. So if you go to southpointforyou.com slash 5K, again, southpointforyou.com slash 5K, you can learn more about what you'll be supporting and how to register for this really fun event. That's wonderful. Um, it's just a wonderful experience for them. And speaking of connecting with God as well as others, in Psalm 18, 1 through 2, it says, I love you, Lord. Lord, you are my strength. God is really our strong tower. Amen. So we're going to just go ahead and worship. We're going to worship with the live team now. Amen. Good morning, South Point. We invite you to stand with us.
can do all things. We also serve a God who loves you and pursues you and wants relationship with you. And when you find yourself in the darkness, Jesus is the light that can bring you out of that darkness. He is the way maker. Will you let him make a way?
for bringing us here today, God. We thank you for every household represented under the sound of my voice, whether in this building or online, God. We thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for Pastor Matt as he comes to bring your word, Lord God. We ask that it falls on good ground, God, that we can not only be hearers, but also doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and welcome to South Point Church on Daylight Savings Day. Is anyone fired up to be here this morning? Hey, we just want to say hi to those of you watching online, wherever you might be watching from. I want to say hi to those of you here in the auditorium. Hey, if this happens to be your first Sunday, whether it's online or in the auditorium, we just want to say thank you. We're so glad that you showed up today. We understand that it's a risk to show up to a new church, so we hope to see you again. Hey, by the way, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. And usually I'm pretty fired up whenever I'm in the middle of a series, but if I'm really honest today, I'm really nervous, and you might be going, well, why are you really nervous? Because we're at week four of a series called Bow Chicka Wow Wow, finding satisfaction in romance, sex, and love. And so just kind of a reminder to everyone out here in the personal room that we're in the middle of a sex series. And so we have this thing where we do age-appropriate ministry, which basically means we say it this way, we do big people church and little people church. And when I say little people church on the other half of the building, I don't mean we do childcare. I mean, we help little kids know about God. We help them follow Jesus and take their next steps. And then here online and in the big room, we address everyday real life issues that we believe God wants to step into our life and as Jesus followers, and we talk about it in a real and honest way. And so today we're going to be talking about sex. And so I think this will be really good for anyone about sixth or seventh middle school on up. But if you have young kids in the auditorium, this would be the appropriate time to run for the hills and go check your child into the appropriate place. And so, hey, I'm going to dive in in a second. So it'll give you people to kind of do that, but I want to say something kind of from the start. Uh, sometimes when you talk about emotional subjects or subjects that are sensitive, sometimes in church we can feel guilt or scorn or shame, um, and I just want to make sure that like no one hears that, uh, that what we're going to talk about today is just about being a better follower of Jesus and actually trusting what God tells us to do so that we can experience the life that God has for us. And oftentimes when something isn't working right and we know we need to kind of work on it and address it, we will often often feel like we need to do more and be more. And listen, if we're really honest, how many of us are overwhelmed and exhausted in the world already? Can I just get it? Amen. Like life is overwhelming and exhausting. And so today, as I move forward, here's what I don't want you to hear. I don't want you to hear that you have to do more and be more. But what if we did differently and we were different to experience maybe the life that we were designed to have. Now here, I want to start off with a premise. Now this premise is science proven, but God's been telling us for a while. And I always love it that when science kind of confirms what God's been telling us all a while. So we're just going to jump right in. Uh, here we go. We're going to start off. Here we go. Good sex is fueled by intimacy as we can orgasm all by ourselves. <laughs> I told you we're just going to start off, man. 
I mean, really kind of in today's world and kind of in society, we often assume that good sex really is designed or right around about climax or orgasm. But the reality is, is that 99% of us here online in the room know that we can orgasm by ourselves. Orgasming isn't mean good sex. And then when we talk about good sex, remember, good isn't just that it feels good. It's actually good for us. It doesn't harm us physically. We don't get an STD. We don't get pregnant so it impacts our life. It doesn't impact us emotionally. We don't feel guilty to your shame. We don't feel insecure, right? Like good isn't just that it feels good. It's actually good for us. Remember, we've been saying the whole time sex isn't just intercourse. It's not just a male penis and a woman's vagina. Like that, that is part of sex, but it's not all of sex. So good sex, which is good for us holistically and sex, all of it is fueled by intimacy as we can orgasm by ourselves. Now, here's what many of you online and in the room are thinking to go, I can't believe he said all those words already. (laughs) But here's the thing. This just isn't preacher talk. Like most people go, well, you're a preacher. This is things that preachers say. But here's the great news. This isn't even my idea. Did you know that modern science tells us that this statement has actually been researched and the evidence leads us to the scientific fact that this is actually true. A matter of fact, in your sexual journal, we're going to go to this quote, uh, your sexual medical journal, right? They actually had the first paper. It's a peer-reviewed science journal on sex. And they actually had the first paper on Viagra actually in there. And here's what they say. Our prediction models establish, what's the word? Intimacy as the main predictor of sexual satisfaction. It's not if you do it from the ropes or from the chandelier or come in like a wrecking ball like they say. (laughs) What they're saying is sexual satisfaction actually comes from something called intimacy, right? And and so again, this is not a Christian organization. It's not a church. This is a science journal. Matter of fact, Psychology Today, right? They're not a Christian organization. They wrote an article and they're talking about how to improve your sex life, right? And so I want to get a quote from Psychology. It says, therefore, to help make your sex life better and more satisfying, focus on the following. And this is their number one recommendation. You know, they thought it'd be like put on candles or use oil or whatever, you know, because we're not going to go there yet, yet. Some people are like, did I show up to the right place today? <laughs> Number one, increased general relationship. How both partners feel about the relationship overall impacts their feeling of sexual satisfaction as well. Given that spending some time improving your relationship in other areas can benefit you in the bedroom. Can I just get an Amen. And if you don't believe me, one of the best hospitals in the world, they have a sex and gender clinic, John Hopkins, which is right here in our local state of America. And here's, here's what the John Hopkins, Chris Kraft, he is the director of their clinical services of the sex and gender. And this is his direct quote. What's the word? Intimacy is the key to having a healthy, functional, and overall happy relationship. Listen, good sex, sex that is good feels good, is good for you, sex just beyond intercourse that is actually sexually satisfying requires or is fueled by intimacy. And so then everyone should be asking this question today. Well, how do I build intimacy and how do I fuel this thing called intimacy? Because there's a thing that we all want to experience in life. Listen, everyone wants romantic attention. Everyone wants sexual satisfaction and everyone wants love unfailing. It doesn't matter if you showed up today and you're single or you're married or it's complicated. And so how do we do this? And so I want to I give us a little bit of like what, what intimacy looks like. And so this, this is just kind of like, I'm going to give you the overview. Exclusivity and security fuels intimacy. Exclusivity means that you are in a relationship where someone says, I choose you. Security means, listen, regardless of your flaws and failures and regardless of what happens around in the world, that we will have a security. And that actually creates this thing, intimacy, because we're not comparing, we're not in this performance, but comparison and performance kills intimacy. Because listen, there's kind of this idea out there that you should go out there before you're married, have lots of partners so you can become an Olympian at sex. But here's what the science, again, this is not religious talk, this is actually confirmed by science. What they've discovered is that comparison, the more partners you have, the more comparing, and you're like, well, you might be the best at this, but you're not the best at that. Like, how does that actually make you feel? That doesn't make you feel intimate. It makes you feel insecure. And if it's a performance thing, then it's just like, we've got to hit these heights, and it's always performance, and you hit performance anxiety, and you actually don't get to relax and enjoy it. And so exclusivity and security fuels intimacy. Young people online, in the room, if you're here, do not believe the lie that you got to go out and give yourself away and practice because it actually actually kills the very thing that you need, which is exclusivity and security that fuels intimacy and a lifelong relationship. And again, 
This isn't religious talk. This is actually backed by science and all the research. Now, listen, I didn't read this article. This article came from marriage.com. So let's just be clear. On marriage.com, results from a Playboy's 2019 sex survey suggest that most married couples value sex and report higher relationship, what's the word? Satisfaction when having an, what's the word? exclusive sexual relationship with their spouse. So in Playboy, the one that tells you you should be all out there doing your thing, they did the research and they discovered that it's exclusive relationships that make us the most satisfied. In the Kinsey Institute, they do public and science research peer-reviewed. As with relationship happy duration, which is kind of that security piece, how long have we been together? How long do I think we'll be together? As with relationship happiness, duration was the significant predictor of Sexual satisfaction. So exclusivity and security are the things that create intimacy. And it gets better and very well mined. Here's an article as they're doing the research in terms of how their sex life could be improved. Now, no one's going to raise their hand here because I I get it. So don't raise your hand. But like everyone's probably like, man, I'd, I'd like it to be a little bit better, right? Like in terms of how the sex life can be improved, people say they are looking for more love and romance. Exclusivity. You choose me and I choose you. More quality time, not with a bunch of people, exclusivity. More quality time alone with their partner, more fun and less. They don't, we don't want to have the, this whole performance thing where like we got to be something that we're not. Like, like it's just this whole idea that intimacy is actually fueled. And then listen, like if you haven't believed me, Women's Health quoted what they call the gold standard, which is University of Chicago study, and it said this. Committed relationships make women almost twice as likely. Yeah, well, yeah I wasn't going to say it out loud. There we go. <laughs> Somebody's engaged out in the audience. I appreciate it. <laughs> Committed relationships. And so here's what the science and the research tells us, is that intimacy actually fuels sexual satisfaction, not performance and not comparison. And so today, here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at intimate good sex and what does it actually take to have intimate good sex? And so listen, we're going to talk about this next week because this week the message is good sex. Next week is destructive sex. It's really one message, but I couldn't do it all in one week. And so you really can't get one without the other. But we're going to talk about kind of this, what I call the false narrative and the unfair expectations around this concept of what good sex is. And we spent the last couple of weeks talking about the spiritual thing that Jesus came, not just to restore our souls, not just to restore our spears and our physical body. He came to restore all of life. It includes romance, sex, and love, right? So we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about the physical aspect. Everyone's like, I didn't know this was like sex ed. <laughs> but we need to talk about it. And here's what, I, here's what I would suggest. I think because the church has avoided this subject, people, we let people who don't know what they're talking about talk about sex. And then we get their ideas from them instead of ideas from what the truth and the science actually says. And then so we're also going to look at the emotional component. But before we do that, because listen, anytime we talk about a sensitive and emotional subject, here's what I've discovered is people will go home and said, Pastor Matt said. And usually what you do is you twist what I said to say something that you want your spouse to hear from your viewpoint. Can I get an Amen. So we're just going to set some principles about this message so that as we go forward, that these will kind of be the boundaries that we use, okay? And and here's boundary number one. Do not weaponize scriptures or sex to manipulate and guilt another for self-gratification. Can I get an amen? Amen. See, here's the thing. I call it the mirror and the window principle. When you hear and you read scripture, scripture is not a window for you to open the window and yell out to the rest of the world, scorn and shame and you should change. Scripture is a mirror that tells us how we should behave and what our boundaries are between us and Jesus. And so I just want to be really clear. If you're here with your spouse or or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or it's complicated and, and you're online watching this, please do not use scriptures or sex as a weapon to manipulate or guilt another so that you can get what you want. Anytime you feel like you want to go, Pastor Matt said... Or the Bible says, remember, the Bible's a mirror for you to change your behavior and set your boundaries, not to scorn or shame other people. Can everyone just nod their head? By the way, that just applies to all the Bible, not just this area. Here's the next kind of boundary, and it's this right here. Spouses are, what's the word? 
Spouses are unique individuals and generalizations exist for a reason. There is a reason why there's generalizations around females and around males. There's a reason for it. But here's what I discovered. Your spouse is unique and you should communicate and understand what it is that they like and what they feel and how they feel up, all those kind of things. And so listen, if I say this thing applies to males in general and it doesn't apply to you and you're a guy, that doesn't make you less than, that doesn't any, make you any less manly. It just means you're different, different isn't bad. And if I say something general, only applies to females and that doesn't apply to you and you're female. That doesn't make you any lady less like. I'm not talking about gender assignment. I'm just saying that every spouse is unique. Can I get an amen? And that we should understand our spouse. That's our responsibility. And generalizations exist for a reason. So we're going to talk about some of those things. But if they don't apply to you, do not feel guilty. Do not feel shame. Just go, that doesn't apply to me. When I communicate with my spouse about this issue, I'm going to realize that we are unique individuals. Everyone nod and say amen. Okay, now the last one, this, this, one's, this one's free, okay? <laughs> healthy relationships are made up of healthy, what's the word? <laughs> oh, like three people are excited about this. For <laughs> Come on, man, like healthy relationships are made up of healthy individuals. And here's what I discovered. No problem in a relationship solves itself. We have to communicate, we have to work, we have to put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants. And when something isn't working in our sex life or something isn't working in our marriage, we can't play the blame game. There are no winners in the blame game. Healthy relationships are made up of healthy individuals who set healthy boundaries and address the issues that they have in marriage instead of complaining to everyone except talking to the person that they are with. Can I get an amen? Okay, so those are, those are just the boundaries. And back to kind of what the main idea of this message is. How do we have intimate, good sex? And so we're going to talk a lot about the physical and emotional, but I kind of wanted to kick this thing off with kind of, kind of the spiritual. And here's the reason I want to kick off the spiritual. And listen, if this is your first Sunday online or in person, please go back to week one. I apologize for the misrepresentation of the church, and I admitted the reality that the world misuses sex, and we talked about that. So if you're here and you're scarred or wounded, we all carry scars and wounds from church and the world, please go back and watch week one. But I do want to set the spiritual foundation as we talk about the physical and the emotional, because they should be the primary principles in which we execute this physical and emotional. So I'm going to go all the way back to the, the beginning, and it's where we actually got the title for our series, Bow Chicky Wow Wow, and it's this, right? Way back in Genesis, do you know what the first command in the Bible was? The first command in the Bible says, then God bless, what's the word? Yeah. Them. He blessed them male and female. So females aren't just supposed to be blessed and males aren't just supposed to be blessed. He blessed who? Yeah. Them. Both. So there's this mutual thing. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply. Bow chicken wow wow. I mean, literally the first command in Genesis is God gave humanity a whole planet, said you can eat of everything. They were naked, beautiful, unashamed. And he says, man, have at it. Sex is God's idea. He's not confused by a penis or a vagina or orgasm. He understands it. He blessed them. And so here's principle number one. When it comes to male and female, they're supposed to both be mutually blessed. Mutual. Everyone just nod your head. Not just me, not just you, but we. Okay. Then we go to what Jesus says. Jesus, he says, listen, here's my command. Here's a new command I give you. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So if you're here today and you kind of go, I don't know if I'm really into following Jesus, right? Or maybe you grew up with something other. But if you're here and you say, I'm a fully surrendered follower of Jesus, Jesus' command to you, Jesus' command to me as a follower is this, that we're to love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. He sets the standard for followers of Jesus who are husband's wife is it is not about you. You are to love the way that Jesus loved you. And he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. Can you imagine how beautiful a marriage is when a husband and a wife are racing to the back of the line to see who could serve each other the most? So it is mutual. It is supposed to be, everyone's fired up about that. I can see. It's supposed to be selfless, right? And then literally there's this guy. This guy's name is Paul, right? And you have to understand, Paul was not an original disciple. Matter of fact, he used to kill Christians until he encountered a risen Jesus. And matter of fact, Paul died in about 72 AD. So this idea that Jesus myth, that the tomb was empty, was a myth, is, is just not true. The apostle Paul died in 72. Jesus was crucified in 33. The apostle Paul had an experience with the resurrected Jesus. And he was speaking to a church a lot like South Point, man. It was made up of people who, who kind of had no faith, some people who were kind of done with church and some people who had grown up in church, right? And they lived 
lived in the city that was kind of like Las Vegas, but on steroids, right? And they didn't understand this whole idea about sexuality. Are they allowed to do it? What aren't they allowed to do? And so he begins to speak, but he turns the world upside down with this premise to love as Christ loved. He says, to the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. And I just want you to know that in first century, everybody would have been freaked out because women were considered second class citizens and were considered chattel. Matter of fact, in some cultures, unmarried women couldn't even testify in court. This idea that they were equal value, equal image bearers meant that it wasn't just their job to fulfill his needs, it was his job to fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband and the husband gives authority over his body. This would have been shocking in the Roman world, anywhere in the world where someone would say, God is telling you, men, that you were to submit yourself to your wife and give your body to be one was absolutely ridiculed. But Jesus tells us this and Paul tells us this is because that we love the way Christ loved us, that we are equal image bearers. Now I want to stop for a quick second because I understand that in modern evangelical kind of Christian in the West in the last hundred years, the scripture has been misused to tell women, you should just do whatever your husband wants. And that's, that's abusive. That's, that's not what the scripture is saying. What the scripture is saying is, is it a prison to yes, it's a posture of the heart. See, men, we don't get to say, hey, I don't have to do anything outside the bedroom, but yet the Bible tells me you should do everything I want in the bedroom. That's not what this says. Women, this doesn't say, listen, your body belongs to me and because it works differently, I don't wanna do it. Kind of the things, you know, I, what your needs are don't matter to me. And so I'm gonna just say no, because this is what it says. I have authority over your body. Whenever we take this to extreme and make it all about us, we misuse this. This is not a prison of yes. It is a posture of the heart. Can we all shake our heads? Okay. And then he goes on to say this. He says, do not deprive each other of sexual relationships. See, listen, I just want to say something. Outside of like physical, mental, or like some physical health or mental issue, couples, married couples should be regularly having sex. And here's why. We discovered in week two that sex biologically connects you both physically and physiologically, right? We talked about all the hormones, the dopamine, the oxytocin, the vasopressin, right? All the things that are released in sex and it actually connects us. And so before science came, God knew the design. He says, listen, don't deprive each other. This is a way that you can connect unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves to more completely to prayer. So Sex is supposed to be a regular part of a healthy married couple's life. Just everyone, just yeah, sh shake your head. It's right there. And then the last thing about Scripture we're going to go through that just kind of sets the pace is this. And, and it's this right here. It's Hebrews. Marriage is to be honored by all, and husband and wives must be faithful to each other. Because listen, I've been a pastor, and I worked with students for a really long time. And everyone asked me, well, what am I allowed to do? And I always go, well, that's the wrong question. Because the question that we really want to ask is how close to the line can I get before I like break the rules, right? Like that's the wrong question. The right question is what is the right thing to do? And so this scripture really just tells us really the three things like in marriage and when it comes to marriage and sex, like I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you what I think the scripture clearly says. The scripture clearly says that for you to have sex, you should have sex in marriage with your spouse alone. Just that is the boundary for good sex and intimate good sex. It's the covenant of marriage. And then it's to be honored. Listen, I just want to say it doesn't matter whether you're married or not. No means no. See, marriage is to be honored. That means we don't de-dignify or dehumanize our spouse just because we're married to them. We want them to feel comfortable. We want to honor them. We want it to be comfortable and good for them too. So marriage is to be honored. So it's marriage is the boundary. No means no. We're not, we're not going to force. Love never forces right. And husbands must be faithful. And what faithful means is no third parties allowed. No third parties allowed actually physically in your room with you. It's just you and your spouse. No third parties visually. You're not supposed to use porn to help you guys have great sex. Sex. Listen, that's that's because you're supposed to be faithful to each other and you're not supposed to do it mentally. Listen, you're not supposed to be fantasizing about somebody else while you're, you're being with your spouse because then you're really just masturbating while you're using their body. Those are the boundaries. Then people always ask me, well, what about this and what about that? And I go, I've read the Bible. I don't know. It looks like it's all fair game. Do whatever you want. These are the boundaries. Have fun. Okay, I can see everyone's in already. <clears throat> All right, now <clears throat> we're going to get to the part I'm sweating already. And I haven't even gotten to the hot part yet. Like, 
We're about to dive in. We're going to talk about the physical. And so we're going to talk about the orgasm gap. We're going to talk about genital design differences, regularity. I call it like people giggled. I, I, I walked this through with my female staff to make sure that I had a fair perspective of men. And, and I said regularity and everyone snickered when I said snack, meal, and feast. And snack, uh, meal, and feast means different things to males and females, but we're just going to talk about and then communication. And so I just want to talk about the physical for a second. I don't know if you know this, but in most research studies, when men have sex, they regularly orgasm somewhere over 90 to 95% of the time. It doesn't matter what kind of sex it is, if it's intercourse sex, oral sex, whatever kind of sex it is, men are able to climax very, very easily. And there's been lots of jokes about men made about that, right? But here's the shocking discovery. In a survey that happened in 2020 of 22,000 females, so it's a survey, scientific survey. Oh, no, no, go back. No, 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 stay there, stay there. Only 48% of females regularly orgasmed during sex. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but remember back in the beginning, we said it was supposed to be mutual? I just want to ask a question. Does, does that look mutual? And the answer is no. It isn't mutual. And so I was thinking about, well, why is this? And there's really two kind of reasons why that this gap exists. The first one is education, and I'm going to come back to that one. The second one is what I call equal, is that sex is supposed to be good for both people. So listen, I get it that sometimes in married life when you're having sex, you know, sometimes things work, sometimes things don't. And that should be the kind of the, the, the exception, not the rule. But listen, men or males, we should be going, hey, how is this good for both of us, not just me? The second thing is really about what I call education. Because can we just be really honest? When I was growing up, all my friends would tell me their fake stories, right? I know none of you have never bragged about things you never did, right? So my friends would tell me their fake stories. And then you'd watch movies and you'd read books. And for some of us, like myself, who were very busted growing up, we, we learned about sex from porn. And, and here's typically the education that we get. A, a male has a penis and a woman has a vagina. And when you connect the two, it's just magical, right? And then what happens is the first time you have sex, especially if you waited for marriage, you put the penis and the vagina together and then the magic doesn't happen. And the guy's going, is there something wrong with me? The woman goes, is there something wrong with me? And what we fail to understand is that there is a genital design difference. Did you know that only, somewhere between 70 and 75% of women will not climax through intercourse alone? And we talked about this. The clitoris is designed and has no other function other than for a female to feel good. So there is the design. Did you know the actual tissue of a male's penis, a woman's vagina is actually made of the same uh, tissue, but it requires different things to get there. And so there is a difference. And so it isn't just bow, chicky, wow, wow, you get a penis and a vagina and then magic happens. There's some other work that needs to be done. This is free for y'all. <laughs> and talk about regularity. This is where it becomes a good feedback loop, right? Regular sex is where, and then all the studies prove this, all the studies say that people who have good marriages have more sex. But then they discovered that the more sex you have, the better the marriage you have. And what happens is when you regularly have sex, what it does is in the middle of all the chaos and all the exhaustion and all the overwhelming, it reminds you and as you're intimate and as you're physically available to each other, you're saying, I love you and I'm serving you. And we're together in this. And what happens is it builds feelings. And then these feelings help you treat each other better. And then, and then you do it and it becomes a positive feedback loop. And then the last thing is communication. Now listen, I just, I just need to say this to all the males. Males, we just need to be willing to hear feedback and not be offended. It has nothing to do with your awesomeness. Most females will not orgasm through intercourse alone. We should ask our spouse, what is it that you like? What is it that makes you feel loved and good? There should be a communication process. Same with the female to the male. For some guys, there's a different thing. And we just, what, what is it that, like, there should be some communications. Things do not fix themselves. We should talk about it. And listen, science tells us, all the research says that married couples have better sex than singles. It's just true. Why? Because they often communicate about what they like and what they don't like. And so it becomes better. And by the way, this just isn't things. These physical things that I'm talking about today aren't just my ideas. Matter of fact, they all come from the research and the science. Matter of fact, in abc.net, right? This isn't, this isn't a Christian organization. This is just, they're just talking to a regular old scientist. And here's what they say. Listen, in abc.net, 9 of 17, it says only 28% of women can orgasm through penetrative sex alone. 
It is normal. So guys and gals, if you have a penis and a vagina and there are no fireworks, did you understand that you are in the norm? That only 28% of women will usually climax that way. For a lot of women, they need direct clitoral stimulation. You never thought you'd hear that in church, did you? I never thought I'd say it in church. Man, it's hot up here. <laughs> Women have the same kind of erectile tissue as men, but all in the inside. Women need a lot of... They need time. Just because it's easier for a male to climax than it is for a female doesn't mean we shouldn't give them time and invest in them. For that stuff, I didn't write this, they wrote that, for that stuff to come into play. After 15 to 20 minutes of... And you don't, you don't, it's okay. I've said all the words already. <laughs> and this, this isn't my idea, man. This is, this is what the science tells us. This is what the non-Christians are telling us the same thing. And so as it comes to physical, I love what the University of Toronto said. They did a study and here's what they said. Giving as well as receiving has its benefits. Research says out of the University of Toronto tracked the desire in long-term couples. You know, you want to be married. You want to be one and done. You want to get married to the person. You want to stay married. You want to have one, you know, you just want to find out. Track desire in long-term couples and determine that the happiest pairs, the happiest pairs express sexual communal desire, aka the desire to have sex for your partner's satisfaction as opposed to just your... Remember that thing we said back in the beginning, God bless them, it's mutual. Mutuality, it's not supposed to be just for one person, it's supposed to be for both. Isn't it amazing that God starts with that and science just confirms what God's been telling us all along. And then lastly, in an article in Very Well Mind, it says this, more than half the women, more than half the women in this audience probably want to communicate with their partner regarding sex, but decided not to. The most common reason was not wanting to hurt a partner's feeling. And so at the, at the end of the day, we just have to have honest conversations of what's working and what's not working, right? We just have to be honest about that. And so we talked about the physical. Now we're gonna, now I just want you to know we're gonna get in the emotional. I just want you to know I'm gonna offend everyone in the room. So I just, at South Point we call these buckle moments, bing, like where I just offend everyone. And so I'm gonna offend everyone. So just, you can hate me now, but I, I just wanna be honest. I wanna tell you the truth. So let's talk about, because listen, the physical part is an essential part to like experiencing good sex. But just as essential as the physical part is the emotional part. And so intimacy requires, what's the word? And what's the second word? Intimacy requires feeling valued. And this is where we run into all kinds of problems. Because we believe as a spouse, well, I'm valuing you, but it doesn't matter if you think you're valuing them. It matters if they, if they feel valued. Because what often I think value is doesn't really mean value to my spouse. I've discovered after 20 years of marriage, the things that make me feel valued are the opposite of what make my wife feel valued. And so here's the reality, both female and male actually want to feel valued. And again, I'm going to speak in generalities, but women want to be seen more than just as sex objects. And men, we just want to feel valued as a sex object. We want to be wanted. And we'll get to a joke and everyone's going to understand it in a little bit. But I want to understand feeling valued matters to both men and women. Can I get an Amen. But here's the tricky part. Females and males generally feel valued. I think marriage is God's cosmic joke. He puts different people together. We just fall busted, right? And then here's the part that's going to be offensive. It's different for me. It's different for me than it is for you. So I have an excuse to not actually meet your need because it's different. Listen, that's a fair feeling. It's an unfair excuse. Say amen. No one, no, come on. Oh, man. Come on. Let, let's talk. Let's, I'm going to use some generalities. And again, these are just generalities, but I'm using them as an example, right? Like typically, typically, and this doesn't have to be true, but say a, a spouse, right, a female, she values and feels valued through conversation and you're an introvert. And you go, well, that's just not me. I'm not a talker. I, I don't talk. I don't want to talk when I come home. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm not in the mood to talk. That's just not me. And well, they'll just have to get over it. Well, that's, that's a fair feeling, but it's just an unfair excuse because if they really need it and it's that thing, just because you don't need it doesn't mean it invalidates that need. Can I get an amen? Oh, don't worry, ladies. Your turn's coming. 
right? If she needs to feel like you are looking her in the eye, putting your phone down, putting the laptop down, taking a few minutes to hear from her, look at her and see her as a human being who has feelings and that is her need, then even if that's not your thing, you don't get to say it's different. Just because it's not your need doesn't illegitimize somebody else's needs. Now, ladies, the same thing is true. When a man goes, you know, come on, lady, got any married ladies in the house? Got any married ladies in the house online? Just maybe type married in the chat, right? Like, listen, have you ever seen your man do the naked dance? See, all the married women are laughing right now. And all the men, we think it's hilarious. We just think, look at me, I'm awesome. Look at me, ha, ha, ha. And the woman's just like, what's, what's wrong with you? And you're like, oh, I want you to say I'm awesome. Look at this, this is awesome. And she goes, you're a moron, right? And that might not be, a, see, all the ladies are laughing because you know what I'm saying is true. And you go, listen, you go, that's not my need. But that you don't get to say it's different for me. And therefore, his need is invalid. See, the problem is just because it is an our thing doesn't invalidate their thing. And when you love somebody, you try to meet them where they're at if it's within bounds. Can I get an amen? And I'm, this is kind of my own saying, but I found it to be so true in decades after decades of working with married couples. And so I'm going to say it this way. Females, in general, being for me outside the bed confirms you're for me. Males. If you want it to work, bow, ticky, wow, wow, you want things to work and to be ready, you have to be for her outside the bedroom. It'll confirm that you're for her in the bedroom. Without that, she will not often feel that way. Yeah, see, there's somebody fired up about that. All right? Now, guys, and here's what's shocking. Guys are the exact opposite. Shocking, I know. Being for me in the bed confirms you're for me outside the bed. For most males, we feel like when you love us in the bedroom, then you are for me outside the bedroom. And so people go, why is marriage so hard? Well, just look at that. They are literally opposite. What do you mean outside the bed? Like, listen, have you ever, like, I, I, like listen, this is so true. I heard someone say that, that, that females, they desire non-sexual affection. And men go, what is that? <laughs> okay, peanut gallery, this might be time to slow it down, but that's good. It is, it looks like this, but like, listen, like, listen, guys, just because we don't understand what non-sexual affection means to a female doesn't mean we shouldn't give it to them. It means we don't grope them. It means we don't do things. It means we just hug them and don't expect sex. It means we just give them the thing that they need outside the bedroom. And then the same thing goes for, for ladies, for men. Being for in, us in the bed confirms that you're for us outside the bed. And here's why I think God did this. This is why I think God does. Because when you meet someone's need that's not your thing, you're saying, I love you and I'm willing to serve and sacrifice to meet you where you're at, even though it's not my thing. And can you imagine when a husband and wife, a married couple decides that they're gonna do this for each other? I'm gonna love you the way that you need to feel loved even though it's not the way I feel loved. I'm gonna choose to serve. I'm gonna, it's about mutuality. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay down my life so that you feel loved and you're gonna lay down your life for me and we're gonna race to see who can love each other the best. Can you imagine how hot the sex would be after that? Get fired. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> okay, you don't believe me this is true? And one again, the Gold Standard University of Chicago study, here's what they say. Sharing chores is the third highest factor in successful marriages. Somebody just yelled out, doing the dishes. There you go. Amen. <laughs> Behind fidelity and a happy sex life. And I think the reason that these are the top three is because they represent two things, on, one thing on the male side, one thing on the female side in general, and then the thing that they both require. First, it's behind fidelity. See, I think fidelity is the key. Where you say, listen, come heck or high water, I choose you. For better or for worse, we will get through this. Now, we're gonna have some hard, honest conversations. We're not gonna lie to each other. We're, not gonna, we're just gonna tell the truth, right? Because we rob each other when we pretend. 
So fidelity is when we set the boundaries and say, we are together, right? And that makes us feel good and exclusive, right? And then sex life for men, like when we feel you're forced in the bedroom, then you're forced out life, that makes us happy, right? But we see in most times that chores is third highest rate is because that, listen, for others that feel loved outside the bedroom, the way that we can show that is in acts of service or romance or other areas that maybe don't matter to us, but is important to them. And then you see, that's what makes a successful marriage and a satisfied sex life. That, man, you didn't have to even put anything extra in offering. And so I would close up this message with this and sum it all up. A healthy marriage with intimate sex requires mutuality, selflessness, serving, serving, and God-given boundaries. That's, that's what a great marriage looks like. And, and here's, here's what's shocking. As, as, listen, as I've done all the research, because you know what I hear most people say that they don't, one of the reasons they don't like church and Jesus is because like, man, sexuality is outdated in the church, man. You guys are whack. Like you like wait for marriage and like you serve and love and mutual. Like it's all about like this exclusivity and like that seems to be like broken and busted. But do you know what the science, the actual modern science tells us? Is this. It's not oppressive. It's the way to have outstanding sex. So I'm going to read an article to you. But before I read the article, because I read this article and to my wife, because I wanted to make sure that as I, I, I read this article, like people wouldn't freak out on me. So before you freak out on me, I, I want to tell you who the author is. The author is a, a, a lady named uh, Gigi Engel. She's a feminist author, certified sex coach, sexologist, and sex educator. So can we just get the idea that she knows what she's talking about when it comes to sex? Everyone nod their head. Gigi was nominated for the WEGO Health Award for her science for sex. So she mostly looks at the science, women's health and relationship content. So this is a female. And as far as I know, she's not a follower of Jesus. And she's all for the ladies. And here's what she writes about sex. In an article in Brides Magazine, again, not a Christian, not a theologian, not a pastor, September of 2020, why maintenance sex is so important in happy marriages. Aren't you glad you came to church today? In long-term relationships, it's important to have sex, even if you're not necessarily Randy, where Randy means you kind of, you know, you're just fired up to do that, right? Maintenance sex shouldn't be the only kind of sex you're having. So like, listen, if it's always a chore to do it, you guys need to have a conversation about why that is. But it should absolutely be on the menu. And then she goes on to say, it's rare for two people to have matching sex drives. Get it? Can I get an amen? Right? It's just rare, right? She says, in order to make up the difference, compromise needs to be made. Oh, you mean like you should be selfless and there should be oneness and you should serve. Like compromise needs to be made. The partner with a higher libido should have realistic expectations while the partner with a lower libido needs to do the same. And then, like, listen, again, not church, not pastor, GG, woman, feminist. Here's, here's her own words. She just drops a truth bomb. Buckle up, they're not mine. <laughs> We're fed the idea that we should only have sex when we're in the mood. Hold on, let me read that again. We're fed the idea that we should only have sex when we're in the mood. This is how unfulfilled sexless marriages happen. Not my word, not the Bible. What she says. She says, this leaves one partner feeling hounded for sex all the time and the other prophetic, pathetic for wanting it. Not a healthy relationship. Maintenance sex is designed to keep both partners content. Obviously, if this is the only way you're having sex, this is a problem. If you feel fully sexually unsatisfied or experiencing unusually prong load dip in libido, that is a separate issue. You should address with a therapist or a healthcare provider. And here's what she identifies, that sex connects, but it doesn't cure problems that we should go see a therapist or a marriage counselor for. Just say amen to that. Again, this is her word. Sex is like going to the gym. You don't have to want to do it before, but once you kind of suck it up and hit the elliptical, you feel amazing afterwards. Her words, not mine. Both partners need to be willing to show up for each other and put in the effort. Everyone in a relationship deserves to feel sexy, safe, and happy. Having sex and making a commitment to having sex through all of life changes, ups and downs. And here's her words. From a science backward, sex breeds intimacy. Sex helps you feel closer to your partner. Without it, it's easy to lose sight of connection. Relationships and healthy sex life for your life take consistent work. It just takes work. So I have two challenges. Challenge number one, please come back next Sunday as we talk about destructive sex because this was only half of the message and I still went five minutes over. So please do not miss that. If you can't make it, go back and watch the video. And then here's really my second challenge. 
If you're here and you're kind of single or it's complicated, hopefully this is some good foundational for you as hopefully you get into a place where you're in a marriage covenant where you can experience this. But if you're here and you're married, here is my challenge, is away from your kids. Take a half an hour, go someplace where you can have a private conversation. And I'm not talking about like 11 o'clock at night when you're exhausted. I'm talking about where you're fresh, where the kids aren't gonna be bothering you and take a half an hour. And there's just two questions I want you to talk to each other about honestly. One, on a scale of one to 10, where's our marriage at and why? How can we work on this? And then the second question you should ask in that half an hour, that hour time where you're together to talk about marriage, go, hey, on a scale of one to 10, honestly, you don't need to protect my feelings because we're big girls and big boys, right? Nod your head. How's our sex life on a scale of one to 10 and what can we do to improve it? Because we've sat all along through this series Jesus came that we might have life and life to the full. Jesus died for our souls and for our spirits, absolutely. Jesus died so that we could become the children of God, absolutely. But he also died to restore all of life, which includes romance, sex, and love, so that we can experience the gift that God has given us. Would you stand with me and let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth, God. Thank you that modern research has just confirmed what you've been telling us all along that men and women are equal image bearers and that it should be mutual. God, thank you for the teachings of Jesus where he says the new command to love, not as we want to be loved, not as we've been loved, but as Jesus loved us. God, that you gave us the boundaries of marriage and honor and fidelity, God. And God, what I love is that failure does not disqualify God, I pray for anyone here who hears shame and scorn and guilt because that's not what you offer, God. There is no sin that can be committed that the blood of Jesus can't forgive. And you're not in heaven waiting to step on us, God. You love us. You tell us the truth so we can experience life. God, that we can bring our flaws and our failures to you. And you love us and you cleanse us. And you teach us how to live in a way that is good and right and leads to the life that we want. We surrender to you, Jesus. In your name we pray, and all who agreed said, amen. Lord, I confess that I've been a criminal. I've stolen your bread. And sang my own song And Lord, I confess That I'm far from innocent These shackles I wear I bought on my own At a crimson cost You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away Lord, I confess I've been
looks like this. I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes. A wide open tomb where there should be a casket. The children are singing and dancing and laughing. The father is welcoming. This is our team the father is welcoming this is our homecoming that's such an amazing song as well thank you pastor matt just to just for being able to talk about a hard topic but in a very good way a very needed way Absolutely. It's so relevant for our culture today and uh, just cheering on marriages and, and relationships as they go forward. And if this is your first time for joining us today, thank you so much for sticking around and for joining us. We hope you'll come back. And we want to thank those of you who are uh, regulars who give faithfully and generously. And again, if it's your first time, please let this service be our gift to you. But if you are really feeling engaged with South Point and you'd like to set up your automatic giving, we'd love to have you do that. Just go to southpointforyou.com slash give. It's super easy to set up automated giving. And by the way, your generosity really helps us to uh, impact our community locally, nationally, and globally. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Absolutely. As well, don't forget to support the students. There's the 5K run and the family fun run. You can sign up at southpointforyou.com slash 5K. Also, there's um, some merch to purchase, and I'm going to show you some things. Here's Love a it. nice sweater. Do do do. I'm Vanna. And here's a nice <laughs> shirt, do do do, Vanna. Um, and there's also some other things that you can purchase. Um, you can go to southpointforyou.com slash store. As well, um, this is all going to support the kids at Big Stuff. And Big Stuff is such an incredible adventure. Uh, my girls are grown and gone, so they don't get to do it anymore. But I, I can remember the years, and they went to Big Stuff in Florida for an entire week. They met other students from all around the United States. They got to hear about God, and they got to hear messages that were relevant to where they are. There's only so much some days as parents we can tell them before yeah. they tune us out. So this is such a big deal for students, and we want to make it possible for every student who yeah. wants to go to be able to go. So we hope you'll help support that. And that's all for today. We appreciate you joining us. If you need anything, no matter where you are, please don't hesitate to reach out to South Point. You can check in through any of our social media channels. But if you want direct connection, you can either call or you can text us at 240-925-925. 8787. Nothing too big, nothing too small. If you need to reach out and get connected, please do that. And remember, you, you matter, matter deeply, deeply to, to God. God. See you later. Thanks so much. Bye, friends.